Australian cybersecurity company CyberCX has just opened a new office in Auckland's CBD to serve as a focal point for its growing business in New Zealand. The company was formed as a roll-up of a series of smaller cybersecurity companies across the region, including Insomnia Security and Gen2 in this country, and now has 200 staff here. NBR visited the company's new space, including its strategic operations centre, to speak with the head of its digital forensics and incident response team, Hamish Krebs, as well as its local CEO, Tim Sewell. I started by asking Hamish, what's a typical response to a threat? Sure. Um, certainly on the larger cases, and we, when we know a really big incidents coming down the pipe, the first few days are really characterised by sort of confusion um, and trying to bring the client on a journey, right? Like they're having a professionally one of the worst times they're ever lucky to have in their kind of business careers. Uh, and we're there to try and kind of hold their hand and be a, a, a guiding light through that for them. Um, one of the things we often tell our customers is they need to be kind of uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And in those first few hours and days of a, of a major cyber incident, there's not a lot of facts as, as, as actual ground reality. And, and some of the forensics and the work that we need to do takes a bit of time. It's you know, human analysis. And so those first days, you know, the business is inevitably, organisation is inevitably looking for answers and we just don't have those answers because it takes time to, to you know, understand what's actually uh, taking place. So that's probably the, the biggest kind of characterisation is that they... Um, there's this kind of there's this desire to know what's going on, and there's a there's a, there's a lack of evidence. The other thing I'd say is that they they sort of inevitably crop up on a Friday afternoon, um, and that's something you want to think about. I think as a as a as a firm looking for a response partner is making sure that you've kind of got a, a team that's big enough to deal with those. So uh, ours is a is a team that's effectively a global one. Uh, we have staff across Australia, New Zealand, UK, US, and that lets us respond to those incidents globally. Um, a lot of sort of smaller response organisations or, or organisations that do a little bit of incident response but aren't sort of specialists in it uh, will quickly run out of steam, right? They don't have a 24-7 team, they don't have a 24-7 capability or they you know, reach, they reach at 2 o'clock in the morning and they, those people need to go to bed. So um, that's, yeah, kind of what we see. Mm -hmm. And so you're, I mean, you've got this beautiful new office here. In terms of your operations and your response, I know you've got the Strategic Operations Centre. Um, what... What does it look like? Uh, you know, are, are the people coming in here over the weekend and, and responding from here, or are they doing it remotely? Yeah, we we can bring them in um, into the office to do that from our side to do the response. We have sort of secure facilities, uh, video conferencing, and secure networks, and secure spaces to do some of that work. We also have the facilities, not necessarily here, but in some of our other locations. Uh, to do stuff like acquisition of devices and imagery, of, uh, so take images of uh, digital images of devices, which is kind of specialist work that you need to have the right kind of facilities get up to do. Um, given the given the size of our team and our operations, we're actually constantly running those responses, though, right? So we've kind of got there's a, there's a constant tempo of, of operations. We're not sort of sitting around waiting. There's always a steady state, and we also have teams who are deployed out on site. So uh, we might be uh, potentially including overseas. So we have a kind of a, a kind of a, a pretty high operational tempo, and that's why we need the kind of dedicated facilities. Okay, and who are the attackers? What are their motivations? So there's broadly two groups of threat actors. We call them. Uh, they are financially motivated actors. So those are cyber criminals, predominantly people who are looking to make money out of out of cyber crime as well as the other kind of major class would be kind of state-sponsored actors who are generally interested in espionage. Okay. So that financial motive, do you find that these attackers are treating this as kind of just another another business? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a business transaction to them. Uh, if you're ever negotiating or see them operate, they treat it like a business. Um, sometimes they're doing quite horrible things in terms of the extortion element of that. So they, they, you know, they're deliberately kind of twisting the knife to find data that's the most sensitive about an organisation and, and trying to reveal that, uh, but ultimately they treat it as a business transaction. So it's, it's a multi-billion-dollar industry with really professional uh, organisations who are on the other side of the bad guys. Yeah. yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of the the types of attacks um, that this industry is is, is throwing at us. Um, you know, what are some of the most common? So the the most probably the most common by numbers would be email-borne sort of cyber threats. So we, we as I said we grip those up as BEC or business email compromise is probably the, the biggest kind of single catch-all term. Uh, so that's anything from you know someone sending you a malicious link, uh, trying to intercept a kind of payment detail. So you know you, you're updating your um, your accounts receivable to a different kind of bank address and uh, and, and sort of moving money around that way. The other, the other uh, major type of crime we see in that kind of space is what we call ransomware. That's traditionally where you're trying to lock up uh, computers and potentially extort 
the kind of the victim as well. So there's a, a double element to that. Do um, the cyber attackers sort of go after companies that have insur- that they know have insurance? Yes, we have. Well, we've firsthand seen that where we've seen uh, threat actors look in networks for evidence of cyber policy. So they'll we can see the kind of the keywords that they're actually rummaging around inside a file system looking for, and we've sometimes seen them find those those kind of keywords. Um, cyber insurance uh, and ransomware in particular are really kind of inter- intertwined topic. Um, in some regards, uh, policies paid out, and that sort of drove the the ransomware kind of um, kind of uh, development, I should say. Uh, however, the other thing I'd say about cyber insurance is that um, if you claim on a cyber policy, by and large, and again, I'm you know obviously not a, not an underwriter, um, but or, or a broker, but uh, if you claim on a cyber policy, you're unlikely to get that policy renewed, at least in the same sort of way or size. So we've seen deductibles go up, you know, 10x after a cyber incident because an organisation is drawn upon that policy. So would it would it make sense? It would be logical then that once a an actor has um, perhaps drained that assurance from insurance from one company, they're not reading up on their on their on their policy and they perhaps don't get attacked again or is that well there's not there's not the sort of single hive mind of these actors right there are, there are distributed groups so um, you're not likely to see the same actor come back again um, we have on that though we have seen so so generally perversely um, these cyber criminals if they if you pay them by and large they actually do again they agree to do what they say they're going to do which is sort of leave your network um, the reason for that is that again they have the, they have their own brand name to actually protect, and they want to be treated as as a kind of a reputable partner. If they and if they got into it was okay, became known that they didn't follow through with their word, and they asked for a ransom, and then they turned around and asked for another ransom, uh, people wouldn't wouldn't pay them. Uh, but there's no yeah there's no kind of um, kind of group collective think about this. So just because you you had a cyber incident with a particular ransomware actor or a particular cyber criminal you know last year doesn't sort of make you therefore immune. Uh, from that happening again some other time. The expertise is, is again, is, is not, not that sort of hard to find. Um, the skill set required is not dissimilar from what we'd describe as a penetration tester uh, in, the, in the West. Um, again, it's the, more about the kind of the geopolitical, the lack of law enforcement, that kind of stuff that, that actually makes those criminals successful. Um, is there a constant sort of drumbeat of against organisations and businesses uh, about cyber threats, yes. There's quite a diverse ecosystem in terms of the mechanics of how you move from that initial threat on the outside of your edge all the way through to being uh, encrypted or extorted. There's often uh, sort of multiple parties in that chain and they, there's, there's sort of groups that specialise in just doing the first bit, just kind of uh, getting, a, getting a foothold or a beachhead in the network and then they sell that access on to uh, they call those, we call those people access brokers. They sell that access then on to the, to the ransomware gangs who will just buy the access. Um, so there is a little bit of a diversity there, um, but it is fair to say that there's a, you know, anyone online or any kind of business is constantly facing those threats, and unless they're adequately protected, they are you know, liable at some point to, to, to find out about them. Yeah. I think one of the, the, the big opportunities that, that we see to grow and support our customers is um, in the public cloud space. We've got the public cloud data centers that are, are coming online in New Zealand in the next 12 months imminently. Um, and our ability with both depth of cloud and cybersecurity professionals to connect up and to, to support our customers on that digital transformation journey, I think is, is second to none. Mm-hmm. What kind of capabilities in practice, what does that look like? Um, you know, yeah, the, the public cloud facilities are, are amazing. They're going to be immense and you've got the, the, the hyperscalers themselves. Um, how do you fit in with that in- industry? So from a... From a cloud perspective, um, our, our team can take people on that journey to transform from on-premise infrastructure into the cloud. And what we've seen with customers is that when they do that well, um, they improve their security and you have modern, well-operating systems, platforms, tools. When they do it badly, you just get messed in different places. And so our unique proposition is that with the depth of cybersecurity experience, with the depth of cloud experience, we can bring those two together and ensure that as customers put that investment into transformation, it's in the right place and they get the right outcome and they build that kind of future modern operating environment. For more content just like this and all the latest business and political news, head over to mbr.co.nz.